Startup companies go through many trials and tribulations. The most challenging of all situations is if the founder is the one who departs and is, let's say, no more. What occurs in the minds of the people that believe in this company? Work passionately to make it stronger and to grow it larger and larger. One word that would definitely reflect such a situation is mayhem or chaos. Doubts of survivability, leadership, and many other negative sentiments are triggered by behavioral fears. This situation happened in Islam at its very earliest, just over two decades after its inception as a monotheistic faith. You see, Islam didn't only combat polytheism, paganism in its specific case, but it also combated a scene of disunity, of a tribal societal hierarchical system that was conditioned over many centuries, if not millennia. And it did so with great determination against the resistance of preconditioning, habits, and ancient belief systems. Yet Islam persevered. It relatively succeeded when all might have been suspect and pessimistic. Islam brought forward the notion of one God, Allah. But it also brought forward the concept of community and the Ummah, the Muslim nation, that knew neither race nor tribe. Islam within its first two decades put down a structure of unity that was both religious and administrative. Entering Islam meant that all Muslims would support their fellow Muslims in both spirit and in life. This applied to all levels of society as well as to all the Arab tribes that embraced the faith. Centralized control was a natural byproduct of such a unity. This central control would entail political and military strategy, war spoils, disbursements, and the collection of the zakat, the Muslim annual tax that is given to the needy. This central control we can identify as the Proto-Ummah, version 1.0 of the Muslim nation. The Proto-Ummah was on an upward trend to take on a larger presence in the region. Emissaries were sent by the Prophet to the Byzantines and the Sasanians to embrace Islam and enter the faith as brothers and sisters to the Arabs. Both empires rejected Islam. And in their rejections came the raising of the largest army Islam had ever seen. From every part of the peninsula, the Muslims heeded the call to battle, ready to go. But then, one big event interfered with the entire exploit. The Prophet had passed away. It had been several months since the passing of the Prophet, but even during the Prophet's final weeks and while suffering through his debilitating illness, tremors of doubt and discord amongst some tribes started to fester. Doubts on the perseverance of Islam and doubts on the new Khalifa of Islam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, became an unwanted and uncomfortable reality. The pledge of allegiance to Abu Bakr and his ascension as the new leader of the Muslim Ummah hadn't gone as smoothly as expected. Such dissonance paved the way for dissent, and as Ramadan of the year 632 drew to a close, troubling reports reached Abu Bakr in Medina. Many tribes had started to disavow his leadership. The more alarming rumors were of self-proclaimed prophets rising up, each amassing large rebellious forces through promises of divine foresight and ominous omens. One domino after another started to fall within the newly converted Islamic landscape. A rebellion was here. A rebellion of a faith, a rebellion of authority, and a rebellion of tradition. A perfect storm of disharmony characterized the fledgling and fragile Muslim unity. The first to announce the breakaway from the Islamic nation and claim prophethood was Al Aswad Al Ansi in Yemen. He, in fact, was one of those who had renounced the faith during the final days of the Prophet. Al Aswad, who was a man of a peculiar character, claimed that he was God's chosen one. And to feed his anointed one narrative, Al Aswad regularly veiled his face, earning him the nickname Dul Khimar, meaning the veiled one. Despite the Prophet Muhammad's warning about him to the Muslim nation, Al Aswad's mysterious appearance and prophetic claims gave him enough pull to establish a significant following early on. At Al Yamama in Central Arabia, Musaylaba ibn Habib of the Banu Hanifa tribe had also professed to be a prophet not in competition with the Prophet Muhammad, but in complement. Swayed by his purported performance of miracles, such as the restoring of sight to the blind, the reviving of dried wells, as well as the flourishing of crops from barren soil, 
the mighty Banu Hanifa pledged their allegiance to Moisailama, their new leader. His was the most threatening of all secessions, as Al Yamama was the breadbasket of the region, essential in the supply of grains and cereals to Mecca. Banu Hanifa's size, economic power, and notorious fighting skills further exacerbated the impact of this uprising. Another clan known for its military strength was the acclaimed Banu Asad tribe. Their leader, Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid al Asadi, was a seasoned warrior and a respected figure amongst his people. Tulayha, as with the other self declared prophets, sought to rally not only his tribe, but other regional tribes, such as the Al Tay tribe, under his leadership. The Banu Asad tribe was also strategically positioned, close enough to the central heartlands of Islam, thereby posing an immediate challenge for Abu Bakr. Tulayha's forces were well equipped and battle hardened and conveyed their willingness in militarily engaging and confronting the Muslim Ummah. Further north and at the extremities of the Muslim Ummah at Diyar Taghlib, reports told of a prophetess, Sujah at Tamimi, who led her mother's tribe, the Banu Taghlib. Sujah also rejected the young Muslim nation and was rallying the Banu Tamim and Taghlib tribes in unity to rise up against the Muslims. Supporting her claims and calls for uprising, were her visions of victory against the Muslims and the many glories and rewards that would befall her followers. Other smaller pockets of rebellion spread throughout the peninsula as well, including those of Bahrain and Oman. A storm had been brewing. Some were hidden, while others were in the open, all throughout the Muslim nation. Abu Bakr knew that he had to act, and he had to act fast. Now, it's important to understand why these various events took place in synchronicity. There were several reasons for the rebellions by the various tribes. Prophecies by newly self-appointed prophets were a common theme, but the underlying factors had nothing to do with faith or religion. The fundamental causes were associated more with power, money, and the societal habits of the times. You see, in pre-Islam and during early Islam, tribal competition was extremely high. The Prophet himself, upon gaining more followers and prominence, was viewed upon unfavorably, not because of any faith-driven sentiments, but fundamentally because his status elevated the Banu Hashim tribe over that of all the other elite Quraysh tribes of Mecca at the time. And upon the Prophet's death, some tribes felt that this special status of the Banu Hashim and the Muslim Ummah had elapsed. Not only that, but a tribe with a new Prophet could satisfy the prophethood void and could hence gained many significant loyalties and consequential power and wealth. The second main reason for the apparent dissonance amongst the Muslim tribes was that many tribes were fairly recent converts and still had not fully and deeply adopted and integrated all the practices of Islam and the proto-Ummah. These tribes now rejected any centralized authority of Medina in all its variations, in the unity of its military and politics, its administration, and the payment of zakat to less able Muslims. Zakat for them should be retained for their respective tribes. The final reason for the uprisings was that all these pledges were assumed as personal pledges and allegiances to Muhammad, the Prophet, the individual, and not to Abu Bakr or the Ummah. And with the Prophet's death, these pledges were all null and void. Islam for them would continue on as a faith, but not in a manner that was envisioned by the now proto-Muslim state. So, just to recount the scene, it was a critical and difficult moment in time for the Muslim nation. One can only imagine the uncertainty that ensued and felt by the believers of Islam. With the Prophet Muhammad yet to be buried, false prophets attempting to misguide the recent Muslim believers away from the true path of Islam rose in defiance. Tribes tearing away at the seams wanting to disband the nation and return to the ways of their ancient tribalism and autonomy. It must have felt like everything the Prophet and his companions had worked so hard for in building the nation was at this moment falling apart, crumbling towards the days of the Jahiliyyah. Not only was this crisis leading to the disintegration of the Muslim unity, but within the same breath, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina would find themselves at the precipice of invasion by power-hungry tribes 
that had set their eyes on such a valuable prize. The future of the whole Muslim community was at stake here. Would people stay united in their faith? Or would old tribal divisions rip them all apart again? Was the emerging Muslim nation about to disappear? And was the faith even able to survive? This is the moment when Abu Bakr transcended the expectation as the first caliph. While others were panicking, resolved to the fact that this was the end of a nation of unity as they knew it, of a peninsula that had been fused in faith, Abu Bakr kept a cool and clear head. He was prepared to take bold action. He understood that as caliph, he had to protect the Muslim ummah no matter what, even if it meant going to battle against other would-be Muslims, and consequently putting the Muslim faithful's lives at risk. Only by neutralizing such a threat could unity across Arabia be preserved going forward. Abu Bakr mobilized his forces, knowing high-stake battles lay ahead. And that he did, with quick work of three of the four major uprisings. Al-Aswad in Yemen, Tulayha in northwestern Najd, and Sujah in western Iraq, as well as the other smaller revolts in Oman and Bahrain, all suffered quick and disastrous losses to their deluded ambitions and aspirations. But the one that was most threatening was in Al-Yamama, that of Musaylimah, known now as Musaylima al kadhab Musaylima the liar. This was going to be a totally different obstacle. Initially at al Yamama, Abu Bakr had sent a smaller army to simply contain the rebellious force, not to engage them. But through human error of the Muslim general at the time, Ikrama ibn Hisham, saw misguided skirmishes and resultant defeats dealt to the Muslims by the Banu Hanifa tribe. Thereafter, the task of defeating Musaylama was entrusted to the capable hands of Khalid ibn al-Walid, the sword of Allah. Khalid, stationed in al-Bitah, south of modern-day Hayl, after his quick and successful campaign against Tulayha, began organizing his forces for the coming battle. Reinforcements began to arrive from Medina, with Shurahbil ibn Hassan's army joining Khalid's. The Muslim army numbered about 13,000 men, significantly smaller than Musaylama's forces, estimated to be around 40,000 strong. Musaylama had fortified himself in Aqruba, on the northern bank of Wadi Hanifa, a strategic location. Khalid, ever the brilliant strategist, took the high ground, giving him a clear view of the battlefield and of Musaylama's positions. Despite being outnumbered, Khalid's tactical experience gave him confidence in his ability to defeat the false prophet. In preparation, Khalid sent reconnaissance units to gather intelligence on Musaylama's movements. And one unit stumbled on an enemy scouting party led by Maja'a ibn Murara, a key leader of the Banu Hanifa. Maja'a, now captured along with his men, was once a Muslim, but had apostatized out of tribal loyalty. Although Khalid initially ordered the execution of the entire scouting party, one of the prisoners convinced Khalid to solely spare Maja'a, emphasizing his influence over the Banu Hanifa, and suggested that Khalid might find value should potential negotiations in the future be required. Khalid decided to keep Maja'a as a prisoner, treating him with a respect in accordance with Arab warfare tradition. As dawn broke on an April day in 632, the Muslim army and Musaylama's forces prepared for battle. Musaylama, confident in his numerical superiority, rallied his men with prideful praise of his tribe, invigorating his troops with the warning, if you are defeated, your women will be taken as captives. His words stirred the Banu Hanifa, who were now prepared for the fierce onslaught. Khalid's battle plan was to strike first and prevent Musaylama from dictating the terms of the fight, thereby avoiding a potential war of attrition. Led by Khalid, the Muslim army charged the Banu Hanifas with all their might. The initial clash was brutal, with both sides displaying immense bravery, yet registering substantial casualties. Heroes like Zayd ibn al-Khattab and Abu Dujana, along with Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, fought valiantly, Khalid himself fighting famously with his two swords, showcasing unparalleled skill while inspiring his men to push forward. However, despite their courage, the Muslims struggled to break through Musaylama's ranks. The Banu Hanifa had held their ground, and soon thereafter, the Muslim lines began to falter. 
Sensing disarray, Musaylama ordered a counterattack, and his forces surged forward, pushing the Muslims back towards their camp. The retreat was chaotic, and the situation now seemed dire for the Muslims. By this crucial moment, the retreating Muslims had reached their own camp. Witnessing the Muslim army's disorder, the Banu Hanifa forces entered the camp, hoping to wreak havoc, and to their surprise, they had mistakenly entered Khalid's tent and discovered the bound Maja'a and Khalid's wife, who was guarding him. The Banu Hanifa men immediately charged Khalid's wife, intending to capture her as she would have made a valuable prize. However, in a remarkable display of honor, Maja'a stepped in between to protect Khalid's wife, refusing to allow the Banu Hanifa men to dishonor themselves. Maja'a's act of chivalry and kindness confused the Banu Hanifa warriors and ultimately they left both Maja'a and Khalid's wife unharmed in the tent. This moment underscored the complex rules of honor that had governed Arab warfare, chivalry even in the midst of a brutal conflict. Meanwhile, Khalid regained control of his forces and quickly recognized the cause of their disorganization. The way in which the Muslim army had initially been structured was based on the groupings of the soldiers' typologies, infantry, archers, and cavalry, and were grouped together regardless of tribal origin. Recognizing that he had put more impetus on function than on tribal loyalties, Khalid reorganized his troops along tribal lines, restoring their unity, morale, and pride. As a supplement, he reminded his subordinates by calling out to each tribe to defend their own honor, by calling out for the importance of patience in battle, and by reminding them of the rewards of martyrdom. In a bold move, Khalid placed himself at the head of the remarshaled army, surging forward once again until clashing forcefully into the Banu Hanifas. Zayd ibn al-Khattab led the right wing and engaged in a fierce battle with Nahar al-Rajal, one of Musaylama's most formidable and respected commanders. Zayd called on Nahar to repent, but Nahar refused declaring loyalty to Musaylama. Dueling viciously, Zayd kills Nahar, causing the first of many ripples of fear to spread through Musaylama's ranks. Musaylama's forces shortly thereafter begin to waver. The tides had turned ever so quickly. Retreating towards their final stronghold, a walled garden later known as the Garden of Death, over 7,000 of Musaylama's men, including Musaylama himself, took refuge inside this fortified area but Khalid and his army were in close pursuit, determined to end the battle once and for all, as his army losses were also now heavily increasing. The fortifications, though, were difficult to breach. There was no battering rams or mobile towers to traverse the high walls. It was at this moment that Al-Bara ibn Malik, one of the most fearless and flamboyant of Muslim warriors, stepped forward with an idea, asking his fellow soldiers to hoist him over the wall so that he could open the gates from inside. Many thought this a suicidal mission, but Al-Bara didn't hesitate. And upon being hoisted over the wall, he fought off the guards and shortly thereafter opened the gates from within, allowing the Muslim army to flood into the garden. The fighting was ferocious and Musaylama himself joined the fray, fighting with the desperation of a man who knew his fate was about to be sealed. In the midst of the chaos and the push of the Muslims into the heart of the rebel forces, Wahshi ibn Habb, the same man who back in time and previous to his submission to Islam had killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's paternal uncle and Muslim general at the Battle of Uhud, made out Musaylama from amongst the enemy ranks. Seeking redemption for his past, Wahshi hurled his javelin, striking Musaylama in the belly. As Musaylama fell, and with perfect timing, Abu Dujana rushed forward towards the Banu Hanifa leader and finished him off, severing his head. The death of Musaylama marked the immediate dissolution of the battle. With their supposed prophet and leader slain, the remaining Banu Hanifa forces disintegrated and fled. The Muslims claimed victory. Though victorious, heroes like Zayd ibn al-Khattab had been martyred. Even the toll on the Muslim army was immense. Nevertheless, the death of Musaylama and the defeat of the Banu Hanifa brought an end to the most dangerous rebellion of the Ridda Wars. 
With the battle over, the remaining Banu Hanifa forces seemed to have retreated to their last stronghold in Hijr. Maja'a, still a prisoner, offered to negotiate on behalf of his tribe and force their surrender. He warned Khalid that attacking the fortress would only result in more bloodshed and that the Banu Hanifa were ready to fight to the last child. Khalid, weary of further losses, agreed to allow Maja'a to negotiate, on the condition that the Banu Hanifa surrender and pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr and the Ummah. Maja'a returned to the fortress and found that the only people left inside were women, children, and the elderly. To protect his people, Maja'a ordered them to don armor and create as much noise as possible, giving the impression of an army preparing for battle. When he returned to Khalid, Maja'a claimed that the Banu Hanifa's terms were in refusal to pay the jizya, a tax levied on non-Muslims, but would pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr and the Ummah. Khalid, trusting Maja'a, agreed to the terms of a peaceful surrender. When the gates opened, Khalid discovered the true status of the Banu Hanifa tribe, but nonetheless chose to honor the agreement, both acknowledging Maja'a's stance when Khalid's wife's life was at risk, as well as for his cleverness and commitment in protecting his people. The battle at El Yamama was the last of the rebellious events that represented the Ridda Wars, or Apostasy Wars. The outcome re-established the prominence of the faith and reconfirmed the necessity for the unity of the region under Allah and the Ummah, and solidified the first true unification of the Arabian Peninsula. The many challenges that confronted the Muslim people had disappeared with the surrender of the last of the Banu Hanifa tribe to the Muslim army. Abu Bakr's vision, courage, and commitment in reality set the golden standard for all future caliphs, paving the way for a united and expansive ummah. From that moment onwards, the Arabian Peninsula, once a collection of fragmented tribes, stood as a unified entity for the first time in history. This unification would fuel the rise of an empire stretching from Spain in the west to the borders of China in the east. What had begun as a small movement on the peninsula soon engulfed vast territories, bringing millions into Islam and creating an empire unmatched in history.